joining this new uh, session of this uh, course on climate, environment, and health responders in the Americas. Thank you very much for being here. So uh, let's wait maybe one more minute so that more people can join us today, and then we can begin today's session. Bien. Bien. Entonces, este, well, bueno. good morning, everyone, again, to this new session. Uh, please remember that there is simultaneous interpreting um, in this course. We have both Spanish and English available. Please select your language of choice at the bottom of the screen in the globe icon. Please remember that this is a seven week course uh, taking place every Tuesday and Thursday. And this is week two, uh, session two. We have uh, today Angelo Atanasio providing us with a brief guide to writing to the larger audience. Some uh, housekeeping. Please uh, check that your microphones are, are muted. Attendance will be checked uh, uh, by you joined in the meeting. It's not necessary for you to en uh, enroll anywhere. Please remember that uh, as far as possible, keep your cameras on during the session and during uh, throughout the course in general. And because of uh, time constraints, um, according to the dynamics of this session, we'll be using Jamboard and, and also uh, uh, having some activities. Um, Angelo might decide to answer questions, but if there is no time to do so, all your questions will be answered by email after the session. This is a 90 minute session. We might, uh, it might take maybe five or 10 minutes more just today because of the, uh, the session's dynamics. Please write your questions in the chat. We'll be transcribing them. The sessions are recorded and posted online within 24 hours. The reference materials, uh, are also posted uh, on the website. Please remember uh, as teams that next week uh, you need to go over items one and five of the concept notes because next Tuesday you, we will be working in breakout rooms with your uh you'll be working with in those rooms with, with your facilitator so that you can you know present your your advance your progress in the work you, you you will need to make this presentation through four or five slides individual participants please check the breakout rooms uh, check the topics and remember that you can join the 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 rooms as observers so you can see uh what you're interested in or which tombs you might be more aligned with so that you can join them as i said before uh today we have angelo atanasio in charge of today's session there will be three activities um in jamboard so now i would like to introduce himself uh, to introduce him. Uh, I would like to ask you to uh, have a look at the URL, this short URL you see on the screen. Here you will be able to access the Jamboard, okay? And you will be able to uh, actually um, um, do the activities uh, as he suggests them. Angelo Danasti is a journalist. He's a Latin America Vintino editor. He previously, previously was an editor and video producer at BBC World News between 2017 and 2021. He collaborated with the European and Latin American newspapers and magazines. He has a master's degree in journalism awarded by the University of Barcelona 
and also Columbia University, New York. He received the King of 2016 King of Spain, Spain International Journalism Award. Hopefully you've been able to write the link and I'll be sharing it in the chat as well. So Angelo, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. Okay, I'll share my screen now. Can you see my screen? No. No, not yet. Ahora sí, perfecto. Perfect. Yes, now we can see it. Muchísimas gracias, bienvenido. Well, thank you very much. Welcome to this workshop. I am very happy to participate in this workshop uh, because I can reach such an interesting audience of researchers. Um, I have read many. Uh, I haven't read all uh, of your works, but I have read some of the abstracts. So congratulations, because I think that the work you're doing is really interesting. And based on these presentations, we will, I would like to go over some points so that we can uh, keep learning in this workshop. These, first of all, are learning objectives. Uh, why is this workshop useful? Okay, let's go straight to the point. This workshop is called Brief Guide to, uh, to Write into a Larger Audience. The aim of this workshop is to learn three main items. First of all, to organize our ideas, to write with ease, and three, to attract the reader's attention without losing scientific uh, rigor. You are expert in research, you have learned, you have studied for so long, you have read so many books, you've written papers and articles, etc. However, there is a main issue. How do we actually reach, how do we transfer this information and knowledge to a larger audience? And this will, is essential now and will be in the future in order to provide society with solutions and to build uh, this dialogue with our communication with a larger audience and also so that knowledge can actually you know leave academic and scientific uh, fora and reach the public so how do we reach these three objectives organizing ideas writing with ease and uh, catching people's attention well we need to implement storytelling what's storytelling i'm sure you've heard of this term lately because it's now more popular. But st storytelling implies you no know, telling a story. Why do we do this? Well, there is a main reason because stories are remembered uh, and, and data are not. Uh, we're going to be reading uh, a few quotes during this workshop. And this is a quote taken from the Israeli anthropologist, Noah Yuel Yarari from the book 21 Lessons from for the 21st Century. He says that Homo sapiens is a narrating animal that thinks about stories and not data and graphs or figures and graphs. And the Homo sapiens believes that the world works like this with the villains and heroes, conflicts and solutions, you know, climaxes and happy endings. When we're trying to look for the sense of uh, the meaning of life, we need to a story that explains reality and also our role within this drama. This role makes me part of something greater than myself and actually uh, provides sense to all my choices uh, and decisions. Homo sapiens for millions of years actually uh, have um, made the most of stories. And when do we really understand stories? When we actually fully understand them. And there is a scientific explanation behind this. 
every time we hear a story, the human brain starts releasing oxytocin and dopamine, dopamine, which are neuro neurotransmitters associated to pleasure and human attention. And this is essential. Neuroscientists, in fact, say that a, a good story creates a process uh, calling a neurocoupling that means vibrating in the same wavelength. So that is to say we connect with that person, be it a, a, a novelist, a, a film, whatever it is, a social media attracting story. Also, this neural activity, when there is this connection, makes our brain recognize this activity uh, as uh, it does with a storyteller. I'm sure this has happened to many of you. We feel we live the story when a film, a novel really uh, catches our attention. We feel the fear felt by the main character. We feel this, the, the joy, the misery, whatever. And why? Because this is based on this uh, neurotransmitters process. But what's the problem? We live in a media ecosystem where there is a huge competition for our attention. And you know this, you see this every day, the social media, the online media outlets, uh, mobile apps, everything is designed and focuses on catching our attention through millions of stories. Think about your daily lives how many times you see stories and also you you see how different types of input attract you but as, as you but as you know not every story is effective and i'm sure this has happened to you maybe five minutes maybe you started to watch a youtube or facebook video or a twitter post or whatever and maybe you didn't like it that much or, or, or it wasn't that interesting and you just you know went on to, to the next post. So that contact did not even last one second because it wasn't interesting. It hasn't really, uh, you know, caught your attention. What does that mean? When your brain saw this post or whatever, it hasn't really released any oxytocin or dopamine. So that's the key issue. We need to uh, excite those neurotransmitters from the word go. In our case, from the first line of a written text. And this is the main challenge we had, have ahead of us. The blank page, have a look at the picture. How do we get people or readers to pay attention to what we're saying? Of course, nobody has the, the, the magical solution to this. Otherwise, we would be amazing writers or disseminators. So no, nobody knows how to do this um, uh, magically. But many, of, many people do have uh, successful strategies. One of the ways to do this, as I was saying, is to you know start writing a text in an attractive way. I am Italian but I have been a journalist mainly in the Spanish speaking world, in particular in Spain where I'm based. And I have worked a lot with Latin America as well and about Latin America, but I'm Italian. And in Italy, we say the following. Uh, uh, there is this quote that says, who, who starts off well, has already walked half the, half the way. And how do we start off right? First of all, we need to, you know, capture the reader's att attention by uh, trying to get them to ask them uh, a number of questions that need an answer. And that's how we attract the reader's attention in any area. You know, this workshop is specifically tailored to uh, scientists, but this rule applies to any area. Uh, now I would like to show you some examples and I'll let you know why I chose these quotes. How I look at this uh, sentence. The day he was going to be killed, Santiago Nasa woke up at 5.30 in the morning to wait for the boat where the bishop was coming. Okay, this is Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, his novel Chronicle of a, of a Short Death. 
So this is, you know, a great start. It has all the elements. First of all, we already have a human being, a main character. The stories that have people are always more attractive. There is anticipation, there is suspense, there is an action that is about to happen. Let us have a look at this human being element. I have read almost every description of your uh, research studies as they have been sent by me. And there was something in common. Uh, none of the 25 or 26 abstracts that I have read included a human main character. And this is normal, actually. We need to understand that there are different registers for different objectives. Hay que pensar que cuando se escribe para una gran audiencia, una de las claves, quizás la más importante, o de las más importantes, es encontrar un protagonista humano de vuestra historia. Uh, the main important factor is to find a human main character. Of course, we don't want to become Gabriel García Márquez. I would love for all of you to have, and myself included, have the talent of uh, such a big writer. However, we don't need uh, that. Uh, we don't need to have the talent of a Nobel Prize winner, but we can do something that can be very helpful, which is uh, to work on that. Let's look at another example. Try to use your head to multiply in your head to 8,388,628. Can you do that in a second? There is one kit that can duplicate those uh, figures up to 24 times in a matter of seconds. There's another kid who can tell you the exact time at any time of the day, even when he's sleeping. There is a little girl who can determine the measurements of an object of a, something that is eight meters from her. There's another girl who would make such wonderful drawings to the extent that she had her own gallery in New York. But these kids couldn't even tie their uh, shoelaces. And none of them had a higher uh, IQ of more than 50. And this is the beginning of Brain Rules, a book by John Medina. This book was a success and it's still a success. However, it talks about molecular biology and development. This is something very complex to explain. And one of uh, the main characteristics of this book is that it's, it catches your attention. It raises many questions in our mind. When we want to know who these kids are. Why do they do that? How they manage to do such wonderful things? So all those questions, when we read uh, this text, are rising in our head. So we want to continue reading. And this was written by a scientist. So as you can see, uh, he introduces a complex topic with this uh, catching texts. A very famous journal, uh, Scientific American, uses that kind of writing style where the challenge is to make something complex sound interesting and appealing. I am a journalist myself. I'm not a scientific researcher, but I have uh, faced these kinds of challenges last, until last year. I worked for BBC World and I was working there in London. And in March 2020, I was facing an enormous challenge in Italy, my country. It was one of the most affected countries in Europe by the pandemic. However, they were doing an experiment in a small town in the northern part of Italy. And thanks to that study, they realized that COVID happens in 50% uh, of uh, the population in unusual circumstances. And this was something I couldn't grasp fully. So I was wondering, how can you explain such a complex topic to a wide audience like the one who reads uh, BBC World. 
and I found some information on Financial Times in a few lines. And I saw that uh, it had interesting data, but however, I was thinking it would be necessary to find something that would catch people's attention to make the reading more interesting. Um, let me show you how I made that happen. So the beginning of the article goes as follows. Sorry, there is some data on the on the English uh, on English, uh, but it says Vo Ogano was until a month ago a small town in the Veneto region in the northern part of Italy. It had some lane uh, hillsides of a volcano, and it was uh, famous due to its prosecco, its natural park, and a natural uh, spring water pass. This idyllic scenario, no one would think that it would become the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic in Italy. And no one would think that it was, Eugano would be the scenario of a unique scientific experiment. At the beginning of February, Adriano and Renato, two neighbors in this small town, became patients in a hospital due to pneumonia. So here you can see the link if you're interested in a reading the whole article. And here I tried to put in practice some of the elements that I mentioned. Uh, so it was interesting to see that uh, we can give names of people to uh, give a more concrete uh, idea and example of uh, close people. Uh, so we describe someone who lives in a concrete reality. And we also tell what happened and how uh, the virus came to the this small town of 3,000 inhabitants. How uh, the journey of this virus came all the way there and how it appeared in the northern part of Italy. So there we're raising questions. And I wanted to quote this with some sort of vanity on my side, because one this was one of the most widely read articles in uh, BBC World. And of course, everyone was interested in uh, learning more about the pandemic. And I believe that making an article with that kind of structure makes it more appealing. And here we have another example. It's a text from IAI researchers that we published. And it was a scientific text that was quite complex and it was difficult to explain it. And it was about the deterioration of seaside, of shores, and how uh, the deterioration in those areas could uh, have uh, be have very detrimental effects. So talking with some researchers, we decided to have a different beginning of uh, the reading. So it said the following, when we picture ourselves at the beach, we think of oh, waves of uh, soccer matches on the sand and kids splashing about on the seaside. However, we are not aware of how the seaside is being affected by what is called the seaside stress. So we made complex information um, be more palatable to uh, lay readers. We wanted to catch people's attention to stop and reflect on the effects of uh, seaside stress. So this brings images of daily life, of things that we can relate to. Who has not had children uh, playing around at the beach? So from those images, from those concrete examples, we can then lead to an explanation about the problem. 
in the previous examples, there's a common characteristic, which is the problem or what catches people's attention is at the beginning, not at the end. Because one of the most difficult aspects about writing in science, and I've proven this again and again, and also while reading uh, the introduction of your research, is that when we give a very wide explanation of the problem at the beginning, we do that and then on the fourth and maybe fifth, sixth paragraph, we have the explanation about the problem. But when we read, uh, we, we write for a wider audience, we have to present the problem at the very beginning so that we raise questions and people's curiosity. So once we present the problem, then we move into the explanations. And that is one of the tricks that works best. Of course, no one has the magic wand to make uh, that work 100% of the times, but it is a very interesting and good strategy. So once again, we first talk about a concrete scenario, and then we explain the context, the evidence, the results. To define the process, we go from the specific to the general and not the other way around. So when we talk about something in particular, we describe something that people can relate to, and then we go into the general explanation. And I was thinking of um, presenting three examples so we can work on them to make this workshop more dynamic. So this is the first exercise. First, you have to write the first paragraph of your article, but using some of uh, the tools that I've shared with you. For example, you can use a Jamboard for that. And once you play around with that, then we can analyze what we did. We have five minutes to write that paragraph. And then the next five minutes, we will comment on them. There is a warning here. Please avoid this uh, general opening lines, like we live in a country like, or uh, for many decades, uh, so and so, the whole world already knows this, or surprisingly, etc. So let's work on the first exercise for five minutes. So I'll show you the Jamboard now. I hope you all have the Jamboard link.
Usamos un par de minutos más por si alguien más se quiere. We'll take a couple more minutes in case someone else wants to so write something down. Don't be afraid to brainstorm. ¿Les parece si empezamos? Así vamos viendo algunos. Let's cuestiones. start. So here, for example, I had a couple uh, that sound very interesting. So it talks about Maria. Maria hasn't been feeling well. She has noticed changes of temperature every day. Her lungs don't know how to deal with humidity in the air and so on. That sounds like a very good, good beginning because we can uh, picture Maria. Maria can be ourselves, our daughter, our sister. So we can relate to that. That's a very good beginning. And that captures people's attentions and it uh, raises curiosity because people want to know where does she live? Why is she feeling unwell? And what can be done to make her feel better and overcome the disease and that can happen to maria it can happen to me to anyone else so it is highly relatable so that's great here we have another text it's in portuguese i'll make do my best uh, with the translation and it says jose one day remembered no he actually got up one day feeling um, sore and with fever. So Jose is also a relatable person. Here we have another Maria. And just one important thing to mention when we write, which is the rule zero, which comes before any other rule, which is that we have to write about truthful facts. Maria actually has to exist. She has to have a name, a surname, an age. The person has to exist in real life. We cannot make up a character and give this character a name. This is a rule zero on which we can build a journal uh, story and I'll never end uh, insisting on that. There was a very interesting story about uh, some girls in the river. Let's see. 
Um, yes, there's Juan as well as a character. You've been actually great students. Joanna as well. She was just getting home after a long day of work or after a trip. And then we'll see what happens to her. This one I really liked as well. Because here there are no people, but there is an element, a known element. In these blue, large blue containers where we keep uh, uh, fresh drinking water during droughts. Here. I liked this one because it was a, like a, a very well-known daily element. It's a scientific topic, yes, but we're making it closer to people. And it has caught my attention because uh, it's something I can see, it's something specific, um, and I really liked that. I liked this one as well because of the small places in the hills in the province uh, chosen to you know um, go on holiday and the climate the, the the climate in the area that the reference to the location is very good because i can you know locate myself in the area um these are just examples you know um um uh, maybe th this is a good example of how we should should not start a text in the last few decades, um, the, there have been a decreased nutritional uh, value in the because of climate change in the uh, populations of the plains. It's difficult to read. There are no commas. There are no people, and there are many technical terms. So we are addressing the the, the problem in general. Okay, we need to bring it bring it more down to earth. We need to see who are affected by the issue. When we are too general at the beginning, um, it, it's not a good choice. Questions might work. How many species do we uh, live with daily? And we don't even know what would happen if we tried to you know, eradicate animals. You know, a, a lot of questions, what would happen if, etc. There are really many options. This is an example of a strategy I wouldn't implement. The loss of vegetation on coastlines decreases the habitat uh, for the species in the environment, and they also affect the sun that we might enjoy. It's too wide, too broad, too many concepts. You need to explain one concept at a time, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, let's keep the jam board here and we can continue uh, speaking. Otherwise, it might take us too long to explain the rest. So just a minute now. Once we have the beginning, and some of your beginnings I have liked, others we can improve on. But we do have a beginning. Um, and then uh, we have already a, a, a foundation. How and now, how do we structure the rest of the text? Uh, our objective is, you know, to uh, get your reader's attention, okay? We need to keep their attention. They need to be attracted by your story, okay? We don't want them to leave. Of course, there is no recipe for success. Many books suggest a recipe for success. If you buy this book, you'll become a successful writer. But that's not really trustworthy. You know, magical recipes don't work. But there are strategies that have been uh, proven to work. 
For instance, this is what the, the economist editors do. This is a British uh, political and economic uh, journal. And us at Latin America 21, in, we, are we find inspiration in this journal. And actually the content is very interesting and everyone can access them. The first issue of The Economist was published on the 2nd of September of 18, 1843. So that's over 179 years ago. As I said before, there is no magical recipe uh, or formula. But if a, 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 ma a magazine uh, has been successful for so many times, they, they're doing something right. And let's see why. Um, and this is just an example. This is translated, of course. Uh, this is an example of how uh, an article, the Economist article begins. It's a very specific topic. Uh, maybe it's not that interesting uh, at the beginning, but let's see what, how they do it. Let's imagine that you are 45 and that you are a lorry driver. You've never liked school and you dropped out as soon as possible with uh, bad uh, grades and you don't like learning a lot. Now your job is tiresome and exhausting, but at least you have an occupation. There are no good lorry drivers. That's what people keep saying in the industry. And the mean age of the workers, workforce is very high, 48 years in Great Britain. It's incredible to know that this article was published on the 14th of January, 2017. And the UK has a similar problem now after Brexit and their situation, but that's not what, what is important for us. What is important is to analyze the structure of that text in order to get, uh, to find some inspiration. And we need to, uh, you know, analyze the text to see how it works. First, you know, the the hook, uh, how they make it catchy. The, there is a main character, there is a situation, a summarized situation. The main character is a lorry driver. And the author is actually, uh, you know, appealing to the author and, and talking to them directly. Picture this situation, okay? This vibration we mentioned at the beginning, creating this connection. You know, picture yourself in this situation. It's a, as if the author were talking to a, to a friend. That, first of all. Then you need to, you know, define the problem uh, briefly. In this case, the problem is the scarcity, the scarcity of workers and the high mean age. You know, this is a very complex topic. And uh, not many people are interested in the topic, uh, probably at least because who could could care about the the lorry driving issues in the in the UK. But still, we feel closer to the to the problem. Okay, so number two, defining the problem, and this is the turning point in our text because it's the moment when we delve into. The, the research, I don't know, we picture Maria who has a cough, she doesn't feel well as in the previous example. And now there's a turning point, we have defined uh, we have the problem. What's her problem? What does she feel unwell? What are her ailments? Okay, then number three, we need supporting data. It's a journalistic article, of course, okay? But we still need to be scientific. We need data and we need trustworthy sources. We need to cite them as well. Um, we shouldn't be too lengthy, but still we need to provide uh, verifiable data to support what we are writing. This can be figures, of course. And later on, we'll see some uh, tricks that will help us use figures because figures can be confusing, and we'll see how to use them um, in a short while. Then number four comes development. How do we solve this problem? How do we solve Maria's problem? So we have, you know, what, ha uh, it, what, ha what works, what doesn't work, uh, what would happen if the problem is not addressed, and that's the development. 
Number five, proposal. What is being done to solve the problem? Uh, we talked about coastal stress, for instance, that was a, the Latino America Indino text. At some point in our text, we need to tell the story of what is being done. Uh, you are researchers, so in your study, you know what's happening to solve Maria's problem, for instance, to address her issue. Uh, um, thank you, my, uh, Maria's, uh, Maria's story's author, because it's a great example so that we can actually visualize the situation. Then there are risks. We need to see what is being done to solve the problem. Um, are there results? Is the issue being addressed or solved? Yes. Why? No. Why? We need to provide, uh, you want to contextualize the issue, not just say what is being done. You, you know, we need to put everything to the test. Then comparisons. Is the solution being adopted just here or is there a similar uh, problem somewhere else in a similar context where the same solution is being implemented? For instance, coastal stress in Uruguay is not just affecting Uruguay. Maybe it's also affecting the Mexican coastline. And they are also, they have the same issue and they are implementing, they are implementing the same method. Um, we need to see which method is better, for instance. And that, uh, you know, provides us with some geographical perspective so that we know that we're not a white fly, uh, but our topic actually interests uh, several people who um, think things are done in different ways. And finally, the conclusion. Um, okay, I have prepared five modules and in the fifth module we'll be talking about the conclusion. Um, and we need to be careful about this conclusion. We'll see why. Do we need to uh, include every element every time? No. Remember, again, there is no um, basic or magical formula or a recipe where you need to use every ingredient to bake a cake. Um, these ingredients, let's say, will make a... Uh, uh, up a great text. We need to consider them, yes, but we need to see which are relevant, if we need every item or not, if we have them available or not. But we need to think about the text structure. A strategy that is useful to understand complex arguments is that of dividing the main core of the text into key points. You know, something like a like a checklist or list. Why? Because there is a neuroscientific reason behind this. The human brain um, tends to, you know, get lost or confused, and it processes information in chunks. Lists are a cognitive trick in order to uh, help the brain control these chunks. An example. You, you you probably have asked someone their, their mobile phone number and they have probably chunked this information into two or, or three numbers because it's much easier you know, to remember uh, a, a long number in chunks. This applies to any kind of information. If we uh, divide it up into chunks, we'll, we'll be able to process it more effectively. Also, lists save time uh, for those writing because uh, authors can identify the, impo the important information in an easy way, and so can readers, because they can, you know, visualize information uh, into as if they were capsules, and it's easier to process that information in that way. And that's also very useful as a, as a rule, let's say, because it helps us be more specific. Of course, we like to, you know, beat about, about the bush. Um, we like nice sentences or phrases, but that makes our, our text um, harder to read, especially for someone who is not a specialist in our area. So we need to be very specific and, um, and practical. And a practical example now, and this has been the case for many years, it doesn't matter if you're Christian or not. Remember uh, Moses' 10 commandments in the Bible, okay? Imagine if the Bible, instead of the 10 commandments, 
told or included a text without commas, without the items, with subordinate clauses, we, have, we would have no idea about the Ten Commandments. However, we do remember the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill, I don't know, thou, thou shalt not lie, etc. We remember the list, okay? It's short information, uh, information that it's easy to remember. And you might say, what about my area? I am a scientist. How do we apply all this? Okay, I have chosen three examples. Here are the links if you want to study this in depth. They are very easy to read. Uh, these are texts for the larger audience. First of all, uh, number one, what is climate change? 10 essential terms to understand the phenomenon. That was BBC World in Spanish. And um, they work a lot with these, you know, key items and lists. And they identified 10 terms that you might find very uh, commonplace, but these are essential for those of us who don't know what we need to know about climate change. So these are t 10 key terms to understand the issue. And then under each item, you might provide more information or whatever. But the first thing that anyone's brain sees is a list, you know, similar to the Ten Commandments, ten terms, and I will remember them. This is memorable. Okay, for 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 instance, something harder: the Higgs boson. Uh, this is a scientific discovery which was very important, but it's also very difficult to understand if you're not a physicist, an engineer, a mathematician, uh, you know, a top level scientist. So uh, what do you need to understand the Higgs boson? Uh, you need, um, this article explains this through five questions, you know, five questions that show me what this is. I think you also, we need to be very humble as writers, uh, okay, you need to say, okay, I'll be telling this basic story so that people understand me. And readers also need to say, okay, I know nothing about the, the Higgs boson. Um, if they explain this to me in an easy way, I will understand. There is a sort of connection, you know, and a, a compromise as well on both sides. And then there is also number three, moon landing, T, 10 key elements about the curiosity before it's uh, landing on Mars. And this is written using, you know, regular Spanish. It, and the, the target audience is not specialized. So the reader needs to understand why people talk about the curiosity and which are the 10 essential um, items to consider. So now we will begin exercise two. Let us go back to the Jamboard. Okay, now, in five key points, five, five key items, uh, phrases or keywords, you need to explain your research, okay? I'm saying five to have an idea. It might be six, it might be four, okay? But don't make it 10 because it's too much. The exercise is to find the main points in your research. And from them, from those five items, we can explain the whole research. Okay, I'll stop sharing my screen now. And let us go back to the Jamboard. Angelo, I also included in the chat the fact that you can add your example to the chat as well. Great. Perfect. So we're on page two of exercise two. So let's take five minutes from now. Incluso puede, les doy una niñita que está ahí siempre que entrega la parte, ¿eh? tiene que ser en el tema. Le, les hacer posible, escriban directamente uno, dos, tres, cuatro. As a tip, you can write directly one, two, three, four, five, and next to it the phrase to explain. It will make things easier for both you and I. Also think about what we mentioned at the beginning. 
to raise people's curiosity. You can even start with questions. For example, I read that some of your research is related to, let me check, chronic non-transmittable diseases. So my first question is, what are they? Or which are the most common ones? Because to me, that is an unknown topic. So let's think about what the lay reader doesn't know. For example, what are these non-transmittable chronic diseases? So we go to the basics of the concepts to make the topic more approachable. So the exercise here is to go to the basics, to what is more specific. And then we go to the more general. So there you can work on the topic you work uh, with, which is non-communicable diseases. So we're going to start looking at some examples. I say some interesting aspects and some others that can be improved. So let's start. First points, recipients uh, unused water disorder environment temperature. I like that exercise of synthesis, but I find it too much, too simple, and I'm not sure if I understand what it is about. So we need there to find a um, common keyword. Maybe in the first uh, point, unused recipients, bad for health. So there is a reference to the main topic. It is great to synthesize things, but uh, we 
uh, careful with always reminding the main topic. This other one is, are ancest is ancestral knowledge useful to face new climatic situations? Maybe I would reduce it into a more simple question, like what are ancestral uh, knowledge? What is ancestral knowledge? because maybe it uh, changes depending on whether we are on the Amazon region, or the Andes, etc. So maybe we can talk about what is ancestral knowledge in a specific region in Guatemala. And then we go to the next point. So we, we can um, simple, uh, make things more simple, like thread them into simpler aspects. Here we have climatic movements. This is an interesting synthesis, but we can be um, more specific in the, in the general term we refer to. I like this one. It has three points. Are coral reefs susceptible to temperature changes in water? thermal stress and there I would state the first question uh, like what is thermal stress I would put that at the very beginning so that triggers curiosity and then you tell me what it is and what how it affects coral reefs and then it says when temperature raises in the water corals lose their symbiosis. So maybe there we can go to a more basic question, answer to that, and then explain the topic. It seems someone else has their mic open. Thank you. What happens when corals turn white? Or what is the result? Or what is the consequence? What is the cause of it? So we can go into more simple questions, like what is uh, thermal stress? What are coral reefs? Great, let's look at this one. Did you know that climate change can worsen infectious uh, diseases known uh, for example dengue and diarrhea so there we cover three topics the first one is that half percent of the known infectious diseases i don't know how many there are maybe one three ten thousand so maybe the more basic question would be which are the main diseases because you take into account that you're talking to an audience that doesn't know anything about the topic. If I, as a lay person, don't understand the main topic, it will be harder to understand more specific information. Maybe we can um, talk about the types of diarrhea, for example. Another example, how can climate change action affect uh, population. For example, here I can ask what local populations are we talking about in Uruguay, in Italy, Indonesia? We don't know. And the second thing is climate change mitigation actions. What are they? How do we mitigate climate change? Can we mitigate climate change? So let's try to answer to more basic questions so that everyone would understand. Is it fair to suggest global climate actions that might affect local communities? Here we are facing a dilemma, an ethical and moral dilemma that is enormous. So first, which are these global actions? Where are they happening? So we can divide this big topic into smaller ones. First, which are these global actions? Second, do they affect positively and effectively to certain communities? And so on. I, 
I'm really sorry that I couldn't read all of those amazing examples. You can leave them there and maybe ask questions and I will answer to them later on. As you know, we have very limited schedule. So I'm gonna stop sharing the Jamboard and we will continue with the exercises. Perfect. So exercise two is the following. Well, as a fourth module of our presentation, I'm going to give you some tips. We don't have a magic recipe, but we have some tricks that might work very well that you can apply into your work. The first one, don't dehumanize the text. That's the most important. Always try to have a main character that is a human. We always want to know how Maria ended up, whether she was poor or rich, maybe if she had this pulmonary disease due to air pollution. We want to know what happened to her besides all the effects on the data. We want to know what happened to Maria. And Maria has to be the uh, it's based on real life of course she is going to be the channel by which we uh, share the information we want to as harari well said we as human beings we understand the world around us if we are told stories and we are told stories about people second point don't write along phrases each paragraph should have one single up to two ideas. That is very important. Once you have written a text, one of the most important steps there is to reread the text. And if possible, to read it out loud, because there you're going to realize if with your breath you can read an entire phrase, or you need to catch your breath again to continue reading, and if it's understandable. So one idea, one phrase, up to two sentences, if they're well linked. Of course, we have to use common sense. We're not going to write a telegram. And here we have an interesting example that I would like to share with you and so that you understand my point. This phrase has five words. Here, there are five more words. It is good to write phrases like this, but too many of this are monotonous. So here you see one concept, another concept, another concept, and that's it. And then it goes on saying, listen to what is happening. The reading becomes boring. The sounds become uh, uh, start humming. It's like a broken record. The, our ear needs more variety. Now listen, I changed the length of my phrase and then I create music. That's by Gary Provost. As you could see, everything was understood, understandable because every phrase has its own concept and idea. I can follow the thread of ideas. As you know, the human mind tends to wonder a lot. I don't want uh, to, pre uh, to be too pretentious, but here I would like to share a couple more uh, tricks. I'm using the, the number 10 because it, it's uh, a good number. So the third one is do not exceed abstract with abstract ideas. Sometimes we can use abstractions, but let's try to be as concrete as possible using a metaphors and symbols, examples and comp comparisons can be good, but don't go too far with them. So 
Yes, you use examples to explain things, or you use comparison. That is also good. Oh, of course, to compare uh, things that people can relate to is a good tool. In his book, Stephen Hawking's, in his book, Brief Story of Time, he used the word example 62 times. He used the word like 450 times and 100 five direct questions direct questions is a very useful trick as well because it catches the uh, the reader's attention so that we can then give them an answer as i said before be careful with figures for example if we say 16838 million people as we know, the human mind doesn't really grasp uh, that concept. It's very abstract, it's very vague, but that corresponds to the, uh, two times the population of New York. And there, even if we haven't been in New York, we can have an idea about the amount of people. And we can identify in our mind the amount of people we're talking about. With 16,838 million people, it's harder to get the concept. Another tip, do not use too long words. The longer the word, the more difficult it is to understand it. Of course, use common sense here. That works better in Anglo-Saxon Anglo uh, languages because words are shorter, but of course in Spanish, words tend to be longer. This is a recommendation. For example, if we have two synonyms, uh, let's use the shorter version. That will make the text more understandable. Another important aspect is not to use negative verbs and nouns. Always try to use positive languages. For example, this person does this, but no, this thing has not been by uh, this person and so on. In the recommendations that I'm including in, at the end of this presentation, I in the references, I include a book that explains the rationale behind storytelling. And it explains how long words are more difficult to understand. It's by uh, one of the authors mentioned in the references. Another tip is when you reread the text, make sure that you don't have two nouns, two adjectives to describe something. Try to pick one. If they're similar, try to pick the one that is most appealing to you. That will help the reader concentrate on the main idea. It, in general, it is enough to describe with one noun and one adjective. Percentages, as you work in the scientific realm, you might use percentages quite often. But sometimes there are too many percentages. And when we have to edit scientific tests, in my job, we find that in a paragraph, there are three, four figures with percentages. And that is very hard to remember. So when possible, let's try to solve it in a more understandable way, for example, 66% is equivalent to two in every three times. For example, I remember eight out of 10 workers, that means four out of five. And that is more easily understandable because for some reason, the imagining 10 people is more difficult than imagining five people. So if we can simplify it, it's better. Fifty-two percent means um, a bit over half, and forty percent is less than half. Okay, 
but they are easy to understand. 98.5 is almost uh, the whole, you know? 10% is one out of 10, okay? So you catch my drift. Um, there is this prejudice uh, that you should not repeat the subject, but forget about this, okay? I remember at school, teachers would tell me, do not uh, repeat the subject many times. That's a mistake. You need to state it once and again, because it helps readers understand and, you know, follow the train of thought. If the main character is Maria, we need to keep saying Maria, okay? If the main character is the water, you need to keep saying the water. And why am I saying this? And this brings me to my next example. I have found it funny that in some of your research abstracts on water, in a paragraph of seven, eight lines, the word water was written just once and as the final word. The thing is that you have said things like the, the water resource. It's like, what do you mean by water resource in Spanish, recurso hídrico? Ah, you mean water. Okay, don't be scared of that, okay? You can say water many times. And then you need to use, you know, commonly used words. If it's water, it's water. It's not the water resource, okay? It's water. Um, also, if we, you know, the reader is in doubt when they're reading something, is this water or is it not water? Uh, it, the reader is more likely to stop reading the text. So we need to catch the reader's attention, especially if we're talking about something so... Uh, usual as water. Uh, for instance, if we're talking about water, it's, you know, common uh, salt and, and it's not sodium chloride. Oh my God, is that salt or not? If it's salt, just say salt. And the final tip or trick, which is also very important, as I was saying, is that you need to reread uh, everything and read the text out loud when it's completed. Once you have it there with you, ask yourself an honest question and answer honestly. This piece, you know, um, if I think about my mom, my friend, my daughter or son, would they understand the text? Because they don't know what I'm talking about. Would they understand this text, this story? And if you have the chance, read it out loud to someone else, your partner, your friends, you know, someone else, uh, someone who would like to participate in the experiment so that you can get some feedback. Because if that person that, uh, close to you doesn't understand the text, then most people won't understand the text. Uh, it's very, this is very important to consider. Okay, I think we're running out of time. Number five, how do we end a text? It's as hard as beginning, as the beginning. It's not impossible, but it's just as important. Maybe the word is not complicated. Uh, what I want to say is that it is, it's an important stage. Why? because you need to write a sentence or a paragraph that, you know, summarizes everything you have said. It, it's a pillar, you know? You had a beginning, yeah, the development, and the conclusion needs to support the whole article. The first pillar is the beginning, and the final pillar is the conclusion. So it needs to be solid. A text with a, an effective closing improves the quality of the text, especially the final lines, because they need to provide an answer or, uh, you know, a, a solid answer to the final question. If you have started the text telling me about what, what ailments Maria had, now at the end, I want you to tell me what happens to Maria, okay? It's an option, it's not the only one, but it's a very good option. Um, actually saying what will happen with Maria. 
you know, her ailments, the causes, the potential solutions, um, whatever. Okay? I need to see that in the conclusion. I need, I need to know what happens with Maria. Maria, Maria's life, okay? How will it go on? And it's important because it's Maria, but not just that, because any of us could be her. We need, what you're telling me is what could happen to me uh, in the end. Also, readers are very demanding. And if the, the, the end is not good, they will get mad. And we, we don't want that because we, we want to keep them attracted uh, as readers. There are some then strategies to have an effective ending, uh, especially when we're having trouble doing so. For instance, uh, choosing, quoting someone famous, a researcher or anyone actually who is uh, well known to your audience, maybe not globally, but if it's, um, I don't know, if you're writing about Ecuador, uh, maybe a quote by an Ecuadorian that people know well. Also, don't go to, don't use cliches or sayings. That's not the idea. That is to find a, a, a quote that can have an impact and that will support everything you have written. So quote someone you have interviewed, for instance, for this paper or research article. For instance, uh, you've talked to uh, women or girls from the community that lives on the Amazon and you have talked to them, it would be uh, essential to know what they have said. And if what they have said really concludes, you know, um, the text. Number three. A warning. So what happens if we keep going this way, for instance? We've talked about uh, NCDs, for instance. Uh, the text has probably outlined some solutions. Okay, what happens if what? Uh, if what we have explained doesn't happen, for instance, what will happen to us all? That's harder to do, but of course you can do it. The idea is to have a definition, uh, number four, the idea is to have a you know one line or phrase that in, that defines the whole sense of the text. It's very difficult, okay, to do this. It's very difficult to you know hit every item in every article, having the lists, the list, the items, the hook. It's very difficult, okay. And you you manage all this, but over time and with training, the more you write, the better you will understand these items um you need to use these items more like a, a toolkit so that you can understand everyone's text it's very important to read other people as well to learn how to write well and number five you know uh, uh going back to the beginning you talked about maria if we started off with maria we need to know what will happen to her etc so this is what the last exercise is about. You had a beginning, uh, you have five items, and now on the Jamboard, try to conclude your text. Consider all of this and write the final one or two sentences. And then we'll see if we have time to ask questions. Let us have a look at the Jamboard again.
Bueno, voy a empezar a leer mientras ustedes van escribiendo, así vamos, vamos viendo y, y lo comentamos. Ok, I'll start reading as you write, so that we can comment. I have really liked this, for instance, the cost of doing nothing, the price of doing nothing will always be higher than, doing, than that of doing something. Uh, that would be the conclusion of an, an analysis piece or an opinion piece. If uh, what I have said doesn't happen, something uh, worse will happen. Have a look at this other one. If the health sector, it would be in, uh, ranked in, in place number five regarding the emission of greenhouse gases. More than a conclusion, this is a great beginning because I'm interested, I'm hooked. I would like to know more the countries, etc. You know, I think this more than a conclusion, conclusion is a great beginning. Por lo tanto, el protocolo de Montreal es quizás... Therefore, the Montreal Protocol is probably the greatest, uh, the most successful environmental agreement. Uh, this is good because, you know, it includes every uh, for and against argument. I have a specific example and we have a final result. I like this one. El cambio climático es la mayor amenaza global. Climate para... change is the largest uh global threat once again more than an ending i think this would be a good beginning why because i would ask myself why why is climate change the largest global health uh, risk um uh, maybe I, I i can ask myself why is it not cancer or uh, cardiovascular disease let, that is to say, it actually uh, gives rise to more questions. Uh, and this is like great for a beginning. Aquí, si lo del, de lo, si el recipiente con agua, no hay mosquito que crezca, ni virus. Um, de... If there are no uh, water containers, there is no dengue virus and no mosquitoes. Okay, that's fine, but I, I, I will need something at the end, something stronger, as in, I don't know, uh, we need to um, wash containers three times a day or something like that, you know? I think this is also very good. It's a call to action. I, we have said all of this, therefore you can do something now to change your health and the health of the people you love. Uh, we need to understand that we are one with the planet and that's key. Yes, that works too. Joanna um, wants the, her children to learn the importance of community uh, so that the dengue epidemic does not affect her family any longer. That's great, they're using a person and they bring, going back to the person. I'm, I'm sure this author talked about Joanna at the beginning and now they uh, go back to her. In the chat, someone said something similar. Uh, fighting against climate change is not just fighting a terrible uh, system, but it's also fighting an energy system. Okay, yes, that's great. The author is well known. This quote, quote is by Naomi, Naomi Klein, so that's a great ending. There is a lot of work ahead. Start your part now, and that's a call to action. But we need to be careful because call to actions are important because, you know, they address readers directly, but they are not useful for every... Uh, they're going to be used at any register because sometimes editors and newspaper editors uh, do not include this possibility of, of, you know, ending an article with a call to action. 
So some editors might, might not approve this, let's say. decir como dice Naomi Klein. Vale, perfecto. Sí, 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 sí. Perfecto. Sí, sí, yes, we will need to say as Naomi Klein says, yes. Um, um, yes, this is what uh, the quote that Berta was uh, citing, actually. Naomi Klein's, uh, Klein's quote is very effective. Um, there is another text about Margarito, and Margarito is asking his, himself the same question. Yes, that's also a great ending. You can also see that the most impactful endings include people, Joana, Maria, Margarito, someone who says something and about what the main character is saying. Mi tiempo está por acabar. Es posible, Carlos. Voy a leer, voy a intentar... Carlos, I think I've run out of time. I'll try to read two more uh, endings. Una conclusión, digamos, más lineal, ¿no? Los pueblos indígenas originarios de la Amazonía boliviana... Uh, indigenous people need assistance because climate change is affecting their health, etc. Okay, that, that also works. Si leo alguno más, un último. Mira, esto y el texto. Esto además bueno, lo tomo al pie de la letra. Okay. Um, we need to understand that changing our food is our commitment towards our individual health and also to the planet's health. That's also great. Okay, so I think this could be the final example. As Carlos was saying, if you have questions or doubts, please send them out to me and I'll be answering them by email. Is that okay, Carlos? Okay. Bueno, muchas gracias a los... Well, thank you, everyone. I hope you've liked this presentation. It has been a pleasure to be with you. It has been an honor to read your abstracts, which uh, are very interesting and also really important for our future. Hopefully this has been useful and hopefully you'll be able to impl implement some of these recommendations. I hope you can you know, go back to all this when you have some doubts and I'll be delighted to answer your questions by email. I wish you uh, you know, a great day. And Carlos and Haley, please go ahead. What should I do now? Should I stop sharing my screen or what should I do? No, simplemente muchas gracias a todos. Y well, muchas... thank you, everyone. Thank you, Angelo, for this amazing session. As you can see, the chat is really active. We'll be forwarding you these questions. Thank you, everyone. And we'll meet again next Tuesday in our breakout rooms uh, so that teams and facilitators can meet. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Angelo. And we'll see, we'll meet each other again next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. See you next time. Bye. Thank you.